All right, guys. Woo. Congratulations for making it in. You guys are here. Thank you for joining us on this panel on how to organically grow avocado trees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, today we have an awesome lineup, an awesome panel. You guys are here just to learn about character design, and we're just going to give you, you got the experts here just to really give you a tap into their mind. We're going to be able to have Q&A. So if you guys have questions, maybe write those questions down and at the end then you can feel free to um, ask any of the questions. So today we're doing the panel on uh, discussing the challenges of designing compelling characters, the ingredients for good character design, and as well as answer audience questions. So as we start here, I'd just like to kind of go down the line and have you guys introduce yourselves and let them know who you are and what you do. I'm Ricky. I'm Ricky De Los Angeles. I'm a character designer at currently at Disney TV Animation. I'm Genevieve. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> it's okay. I'm Genevieve Sai, and I'm a character designer and story artist at DreamWorks. Hello, uh, my name is Wouter Tulp. I'm a character designer from the Netherlands, and I'm currently working for Skydance. Yeah. Hi, you guys. I'm, uh, I'm Danny Arriaga. I'm a, a character art director at Disney Animation Feature Effects. So the first thing that I want to ask is, again, what I know a lot of people always have questions about is, how did you break in? Like, how did this start for you? I always feel there's a moment. It's not just, oh, I went to school and I was doing this. There's a certain moment that happens where you happen to be at a convention and you met someone and they led you, hey, give me a call, and all of a sudden that job happens. Like for myself, I met someone, I showed up at an event where there was a storyboard artist from Freakazoid was there, I showed him my portfolio, and he said, hey, you're not so good, not so great, but keep in touch. And I said, keep in touch, I'm gonna keep in touch with that guy. And it was about a year later, I built up the confidence to eventually call him up, and then he had me come up to Warner Brothers, and that's how it started for me, just from that one-time introduction, right? So um, what, what happened for you guys? So let's go down the line. <clears throat> um, so, you know, I've done some, after school, uh, I did some, like, a lot of freelance uh, character designing. Like, I did some for Bento Box for a show and development. Um, but, you know, in between all that, working on my own art, and um, I was at uh, Disney Consumer Products for about seven years, about two years ago, I got an email from one of the production managers on the Casa Grandes at Nickelodeon and asked if uh, they'd like to, uh, uh, if I'd like to do a character design test. And uh, so yeah, so I jumped at the opportunity because I'd been wanting to get into uh, a show or animation in general and I saw it as like, oh, this, this could be it. And um, so I did the test and I got an interview and then uh, that's when I started on there for about a year, and then after that, um, I went over to Disney TV. Um, but I think all of that had been the culmination of like just a lot of work and a lot of like time put in to developing like my skills and like sharing my stuff. Um, it, it helped that the uh, the executive producer um, had a copy of my uh, Coco book, um, so that kind of was almost like a calling card in a way too. Um, so that was cool how that worked out. All right. <laughs> well, actually, I actually I started in in games, and I I went to um, I've all, I've always wanted to be in TV and film. Hey, Genevieve, could you maybe speak up a little? Oh Is yeah. Louder? Oh sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? Is that okay? Um, I, yeah, I, I started in games, and I've I've always wanted to be in um, TV and film. And when I went to CTN, I I started learning that uh, what they're looking for in in TV and film, you have to build your a separate portfolio for specifically for that industry. So while I was working in games, I was working on my own side stuff um, and and freelancing for uh, film and, and TV on the side. So I built up that portfolio and kept going to conventions. And uh, um, I met a, a great friend of mine um, back in the Bay Area, uh, Pascal Campion. And I was, I was just kind of talking to him um, about like giving, like he was helping me so much on story advice, um, how, to, how to tell a story in one image. Um, and so 
I, I kind of tr tried to grow my portfolio that way um, and just keep meeting more people through conventions. Um, I met Chris, Chris Sanders through um, conventions as well. And so that's how I, I got a couple of my jobs from uh, and transitioned from uh, going to the Bay Area to LA to start my career in character design. But I've always been char doing character design on the side, uh, freelancing. But um, yeah, meeting a lot of people through the con, the con circuit is, is wonderful. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the question was, when was this moment where Yeah, you when was this moment that, you know, you got that call to work, get work yes. in the studio? Start well, uh, my story may be a little different. Uh, I'm not from the United States, uh, and I'm old. Uh, <laughs> I, I started in uh, 2002. I came out of art school in the Netherlands, and uh, this was, uh, it, it was called art school, but it was the only thing it had to do with art. Uh, so I didn't learn anything there. They, they didn't teach me perspective or color theory. We don't have an industry like, like you have here. So uh, the uh, art schools, they were focused on modern art and you know, students who got out of art. You know, people got, went to art school because they wanted four years of smoking marijuana and do, <laughs> doing nothing really. So uh, I wanted to learn how to draw and I was almost expelled because I said that out loud. So. <laughs> Um, so when I got out of art school, I, you know, first of all, I thought I, I uh, need to learn something. You know, I, I, I want to learn how to draw still. So, um, and maybe, you know, I, I broke in twice, actually, because the first time, you know, this was 2002. Facebook didn't even exist. Instagram didn't exist. So you can imagine that I was completely detached from any other country than my own country. And... Uh, I wanted to make a living doing art, and, and the Netherlands is really a very small country. So uh, I could travel the country, uh, and what I did, I had this big uh, portfolio. Uh, you know, I say big because it was <laughs> actual paper, you know, paintings and drawings. And I would vis visit, uh, uh, you know, uh, children's books, uh, publishers, and uh, newspapers, uh, editors, and, and stuff. Uh, and, and show them my work. And maybe this is not really helpful for you here now in the sense that people don't do that anymore w with the big portfolios, but maybe in the, in the sense of mentality, it, it may be helpful because what I did was I traveled to, I, I discovered that in a building where there was a publisher, usually there were more publishers than just that one. So I had an appointment with this one publisher, and then I, after I met them, I went into the elevator and just accidentally stopped on another floor and walked in with my work, and I said, I'm lost, but now that I'm here, can I show you my work? <laughs> and so that, that's how I, uh, how I made sure, you know, at, and uh, I think the, the way of, you know, being there and, and just showing your work, not being shy, was a, was a very good way because still it took two years f for anyone c to call me uh, because everyone said, well, you, we love your work, but you're a student just coming out of art school and we have people we work with and we like them. We're not going to replace them with someone new. Uh, so it took a while. And then what I, what, I, what I did, especially because it was such a small country, was you know, take on everything. So that uh, I did children's books, illustration, editorial illustration, caricatures for newspapers, background art for animations, for commercials, uh, everything, uh, so that I, I could make a living. And with each job, I set an assignment for myself. You know, I can't use I outlines for this children's book or this, you know, I, I caricature, I want to use ink. And, and that way, I, I basically schooled myself in all kinds of techniques and styles. And then at a certain point, there was a recession in the Netherlands where especially magazines, which I was doing a lot at the time, they didn't have as much money anymore. And I, I, I felt, you know, they're hiring me less than they did before. So I thought I need to do something different. And at that time, uh, I saw the, the Monsters, Inc. art book. And, uh, you know, I, I, is anyone else here from another country than the United States? Okay, okay. Wow. So um, being in the Netherlands is, uh, is a different uh, experience when it comes to uh, the movie industry. There's nothing there. And so I was completely detached. And also the access to, uh, uh, to information. You know, uh, the internet wasn't what it 
was uh, right now. So I didn't have all the, the images. And I, when I saw that art book, I saw these, these Nico Morlay drawings, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. This is what I want to do. But what is this? And uh, that's when I decided I, wa I want to, you know, this is the kind of work I want to do. But I had no idea. I, I knew nobody outside of the Netherlands even. And then uh, at another art school, uh, I, I heard that Peter de Sav was going to do a talk. And uh, I, I, I looked it up and I said, wow, that's the guy who did Scrap from, from Ice Age. I need to, I need to listen to, to that guy. So I went there. And uh, before the, the lecture started, I went to the restroom. And, and I was peeing. <laughs> did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> But I looked over my shoulder, which you, you're not supposed to do, but I did. <laughs> uh, and it was Peter de Sav, and he looked at me, and, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> and so uh, I left him, uh, you know, I, d I didn't speak to him there. But, you know, during the, the talk, uh, uh, after the talk, I, I asked him, uh, you know, everything I wanted to know. And, and what he said was, you know, what you should do is, you know, create a portfolio that's focused on character design because w he looked at my work and he saw all this diversity because I did all these kinds of jobs. And he said, you know, you should have a character design portfolio and uh, then you should go to CTN. This is a new event. They're just starting and you should go there and, and show your work. And so what I did was I did a lot of children's books at the time and I used these children's books as, you know, uh, as I imagined them to be a movie and I started doing character designs for the children's books and uh, at least what I thought what character designs were uh, because I, I no, no one could tell me what, what the job actually uh, meant. Um, but that's what I did and I, uh, I went to CTN, uh, met people like, like uh, Stephen here and uh, you know the first year n nothing much happened and then at the time in the Netherlands they were doing a, a 2D feature uh, which was rare which uh, the last time they, they tried that was 30 years earlier uh, but, you know, because I had been posting these character designs, they saw that, and uh, I got to be a character designer on that movie, and I had no idea what I was doing, but I was having a good time. They liked what I did, and then uh, Harold Sieperman, uh, he, is the, 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 he was the designer from uh, the, uh, Mulan and uh, the, the gorillas from Tarzan, and you know, so he, he worked for Disney. Uh, not at that time, but he had worked for Disney, and he was in Germany, not so far from where I lived, and he saw what I was doing for this 2D movie, and so he brought me over to Germany, and that was basically my teacher, uh, you know, uh, uh, because I got to work with him on a, on a feature that, that he was directing, and from then on, you know, I, I learned so much from him because he had the experience in the studios here, he knew people, and, and the other thing was I kept going to CTN or Lightbox, you know, events like this every year because, especially because I was so far from the United States, you know, I felt I need to show my face, get to know people, start networking, uh, and so that's basically how how it how I started out. You know, first uh, time was someone who couldn't do a, a job and and uh, mentioned my name, so I I got to do that job, and one thing led to another. So that's basically right. how I rolled into the industry. Right on, thanks, Walter. Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> A, that's a really uh, great journey, Walter. <laughs> um, mine's is a simple one, you guys. Um, you know, you go to art school, you know, because you like, oh, I, I'm, I'm gonna draw for a living, and you, you realize, holy damn, there's a lot of people that want to do this. Um, and I just knew that I couldn't wait to graduate. Like, I was like, I have to start now because what are they gonna tell me? No, right? So, uh, being, I went to Academy of Art College in San Francisco. And uh, into my third year, I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wait. I'm just gonna start sending my stuff in to Pixar, because uh, it's in the Bay Area and it doesn't hurt. I'm just gonna send it in, and even if it's not for an art position, I don't care. I'll just gonna, I gotta get in. And, and then once I'm in there, I'll prove myself. And so I just started uh, sending in my portfolio. Anytime I saw it opening on their oh, their website a long time ago, it was way different back then. I would just send it in. I would send send portfolio in, and then a little cover letter like what I want to do. And I got a rejection letter like three different times. Uh, but I, I didn't care. You know, I was like, whatever, I'm in school still, so no big deal. But the final time, which is like the third or fourth time, I got a call back while I was in class. And they were like, hey, we, 
see that you're really persistent and we love that energy. We want to bring you in for an interview, but it's not for an art related job. This is going to be for something technical. You're going to be taking notes for a technical team and you're going to be handing out uh, whatever the artist needs. Um, is that, are you cool with that? I, I, know, I hope it's okay. And I was like, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, it's all right. And so I, I went in, did the interview, and then like a week later they called me and were like, we love you, you're a great person, and we see that you wanna learn a lot, and come join us. And that was like, that's how I got in. I got into Pixar just like that. Um, but you know, I got in as a PA. So as a PA, I needed to make sure I did my job first, right? I didn't want them to think I'm going in there just to get in to do art. So I did my job first. I always try to do it the best I could. Um, but after work, I would stay and draw and pull the, the, the files out. So I had like an original Incredibles art in front of me, right? And they still used to have like, you know, Lou Romano was doing these beautiful gouache paintings and I had them in my hand and I'm just like, oh, it was like, wow. <laughs> like blew my mind. I was like, oh. then Tony Ficelli character designs, Teddy Newton designs, and it's like these masters, like, and I'm just, I had no idea what I was being given the opportunity to do. I just know, I was, oh, this is cool, it worked out. I'm like, it's working, you know? But at the same time, you guys, I was, I was married really young and I had a baby really young. So I also had a family I had to take care of at the same time. So I couldn't put 100% into my free time in the art because it was like, there was, I had to be a dad too, you know, and a husband. And so uh, just working any chance I could get, working after work, during lunch, I, it basically it got to the point where I didn't even want to sleep because I wanted to wake up to start drawing again because I wanted to get better because that's how bad I wanted the job. And it was that passion that energy that got me into the next stage. The, the artists there saw that I, I could draw, they kept looking at my work, and I would ask for feedback all the time. And one day when they had an opening on Ratatouille, they were like, hey, we know you, you like to draw, we have an opening, we'd love to bring you into the art side of things. I showed my portfolio, uh, about a week later I heard back and they, they said yes. And that, that was how I made that transition into doing art for a studio. And from then on a lot of just other little things happened, you know. Very cool, very, so yeah. what? Awesome. So, what did we kind of learn really in that? You know, one of the most important things is you gotta show up, you know, it's just like what you guys are doing, you show up. What's another thing that's so important is be persistent. You know, don't be a pest, but be persistent. It's just like keep trying, keep working. You're gonna get ghosted, you're gonna get rejected all the time, and even all of us as professionals today, we still get ghosted. It still happens. Things don't always go the way you want it to go. And the third really ingredient is make friends. That's going to be one of the most essential things because you start to hear things and just being around, it's just such an important thing. I also just want to mention when putting together your character design portfolio, today, in today's world, how important it is just to be, you've got to be a chameleon. You really, you do. You kind of got to be able to draw many different styles. The more you show variety, versatility, the better chances you have of potentially getting on the show. So just keep that in mind as you guys are working towards um, your careers. All right, so let, let's kind of get into um, the ingredients of good character design. In your, in your own opinion, what do you feel is, uh, you know, some of the ingredients that you really uh, put into your artwork that make an effective character design? Start All right. Um, you know, it's it's so weird to like think about that because like I kind of just I kind of just do it. Like I just draw like draw what I like, and um, I try to keep in mind like the things that uh, that appeal to me, like like shape and uh, like a graphic quality. And uh, you know, I'm influenced a lot by mid-century artists, um, classic Disney. And it's all like, I kind of just like, it all comes out like in a melting pot kind of thing. But, you know, when, I, when it comes down to it, like strong silhouette, like strong posing, um, expression, uh, line of action, like the, the basics, I guess. Um, and, and really trying to like, like imbued life to that personality. Like they're, they're like their own thing. They're not just like a cardboard of something like they're, they they can be real, um, but yeah, like those uh, are the things I try to keep in mind. Um, but but when it comes down to it, I, I love drawing graphically. I love drawing, uh, like getting the the basic essence and shape down to something, whether it be a person or animals, mm -hmm. and try to stylize that thing. Um, and I'm always working on that. Yeah, yeah. cool. 
All right, Katie. I don't know. I, I always think about the personality of a, of a character. Like, if, if there's a basis of, like, if you get a script or um, if you're designing a character with something in mind, like a description, I think about what is that character's story and h how does that come across in his the way he presents, he or she presents himself, or if it's you know if it's an, an animal, like we want to caricature it in a, in a personify it in a way that makes that story read. Um, and there's um, I can you also I'll think about if you're working on a show, um, is there an existing character before it, or if you're making it from scratch, like think about how because um, you do want appeal, but you also want to make sure that the design works with the context of that show. Um, mm -hmm. But I also think about rhythm and flow. Um, what it, it was mentioned before is like the, the line of action, um, it proportions, uh, mm -hmm. making it, you know, the proportions of characters like, uh, you know, varying them and thinking about how they fit into the rest of the cast, the roster, because sometimes character design is more just about like how you present them as a whole and not just one. Um, design but how they fit in and um, that in itself tells the story too so I think yeah <laughs> um, yeah for me uh, I, I in a way I always find it strange that uh, character design is a separate thing from uh, you know uh, a story what story artists do or what environment designers do because it's all the same story we're telling um, I used to play in bands and uh, I play the saxophone, but I al also always try to play a little bit of piano, you know, at least learn how to play a little bit of piano, learn how to play the bass and the drums. So I know what their role is, and I know what they need, because you're making music together. And with a movie, I think it's the, it's the very same thing. And so the character is uh, the vehicle. O often is, you know, it, it's often a first-person story, so we... we uh, tell the story through the eyes of, of this character. We follow this character and he doesn't exist, but everything that is designed or, or uh, created is there to tell this story. It's not, uh, you know, it's not an actual person. That's why you often don't see people go to the restroom. Uh, I, I have a thing with restrooms today. I don't know what <laughs> it is. But you don't see that often in a story because it's not, uh, you know, it's not helping to, to explain what the, the theme of the story is. Well, and, uh, unless it's a, it's a vital element of what the story is about. Uh, but uh, so I like to think of the psychology of the, uh, of the character. You know, who is this? Why is he here? You know, what is he wearing? It, uh, what is his posture? You know, if I ask s uh, one of you to stand up, it depends on your personality. If you stand up and you're confident and you like it, you know, like being in the spotlight, or maybe you're <coughs> nervous, it's on, uh, suddenly everyone's looking at you, that does something to you know, the, the way your muscles tighten or relax, uh, you know, the clothes you wear, maybe it's something you, you wear because you want to stand out and you want recruiters to notice you, or maybe you, you, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, old because you, you don't have a lot of money, so you wear old clothes, you know, everything has a reason, and you're trying to think of the, the story you're telling and the backstory of the character, and uh, I think those techniques, you know, like shape and line of action, you uh, use them to to help tell that story you know if you have a story where you have a character and you you need a weak line of action or a, or a weak shape that can also be a solution if that is that is the story you were telling so for me it always starts with the story and i i actually would recommend to uh you know write your own stories so that you know just like i did with the music you know so that you know what the other departments are doing and what their needs are uh, and so, because it also helps for you to collaborate in a, in a much more effective way. Thank you. All right, Daniel? Yeah, um, one of the first things I think about when I like, character design you guys is the very first thing that comes to my head is caricature. Um, all that other stuff, you're absolutely, the basics, you're gonna, get, you're gonna get better at that if you work hard. But the mentality is, in my mindset, you guys, it's caricature. It's like, look at this room. So many different people, each one of you, different characters different we're all different shapes different sizes different colors and that's that's what really that's that's the biggest tool that I've been able to take with me going going forward is really just observing the world around you and the other part is research right mm -hmm. doing your research because 
these stories that we work on, these a lot of them take place at different times and different, you know, different part of the world, different cultures. And animation has gotten a lot better um, at being at doing their research and not just telling these generic stories, you know, and with beautiful animation, beautiful art and all that stuff, but the it was kind of it was it was not done the way it is now. And so uh, research is a big thing and that that is something I learned firsthand from uh, John Lasseter, who you guys all know who he is, and he was, he was, that's the number one thing he always emphasizes, you gotta do your research, guys, you gotta, <laughs> you, you just can't make this stuff, like, what are you gonna make? And so you, you take that in, and so the more you learn, and then you add the caricature to it, and you add the hard work that it takes, you end up with a beautiful cast of characters. And the beautiful thing about working in a studio is you're not creating these characters alone. You have a team of people that are just as talented, if not way better, and you guys all get to collaborate. It's not a competition. It is, because we all want this job, but it's a team, right? Mm -hmm. And we're all here to make each other better, and that's how you end up with these casts that, that come together. Steven, you've created a very memorable cast in Kim Possible. And you did that. You you got to do something really cool because that doesn't that doesn't happen. <laughs> like your your style really carried the look of that whole yeah. lineup. I, that's something I can't say I've ever done. I've never my, my my style has never carried an entire lineup. It's always been with a team of people. So. Right on. Thanks, guys. So, again, a lot of the things that we're hearing is, you know, just even just caricature, right? So you want to be a good cat. I, I think every single character to designer that I know can do caricature. It's one of those ingredients. It's about squash and stretch, playing with proportions, playing with your shape language. So that plays a huge part, but story. Story is such a big thing in all of this. Just almost just know what you want to do. I believe you got to have the story and then gesture. Like I can't, if I tell you, just um, draw someone sitting, well, are they sitting because they're paying attention? Are they sitting because they're bored? Are they sitting because they're tired? If you don't know what the story is, well, then how can you do an effective take on it? And Norman Rockwell, what I loved about him, for those of you guys who are familiar with Norman Rockwell, he would start his story process sometimes just with a lamppost. Okay, there's a lamppost. Let me draw the lamppost. Who's next to a lamppost? Oh, there's a sailor leaning up against the lamppost. That's not, oh, and the sailor, he probably has a dog. You know, and all of a sudden, it just went from one thing to another. So allow yourself to explore that story and, and stay loose and stay rough and don't try to, the worst thing you can do is try to get to the details so quickly. You can't do that. It's, it's an evolution. You gotta go through that rough uh, phase, all right? Um, so what I wanted to uh, just ask you guys too, and then I think maybe we'll, uh, just looking at the time here, I wanna get some questions too, but one of the, one of the things that I always um, I'm fascinated in, I know I get a lot of questions from students how do you handle those bad drawing days? Because as professionals, we all have mm -hmm. shitty drawing days. There's, not everything's gonna be just great. You're not always on, and it's hard, and, but you gotta throw on that professional hat, and you got those deadlines, and you gotta meet those deadlines, and even though you're having that bad drawing day, you gotta work through it somehow. So is there something that you guys do? For myself, I, I will oftentimes just get up, walk away, maybe draw something completely different, um, I might even switch and use my other hand, my left hand, you know, I'm right handed just to change up my consciousness of some sort. But is there anything that you guys do? Ricky. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, like sometimes I like get up, I take a walk, uh, spend some time in nature to like just get refreshed, get away from screens. Um, uh, I started bird watching recently and that's been like really meditative. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes drawing, s just fitting in like just a, a quick sketch for myself in between breaks to draw something completely different that's not like work related. Um, and sometimes it's just powering through it too, you know? Even if it's just like drawing like a rough, you know, and then it's like, okay, I'll come back to this later. Sometimes just stepping away from it and moving on to the next thing um, helps too. Sometimes I just don't draw at all. Like, it's like, okay, I'm quitting. <laughs> I'm quit art. <laughs> like, I'm just gonna go watch TV for a few hours and then just come back to it. Um, sometimes when I'm just, my creative bank account uh, uh, is like drained, like I'll go have a drawing day with a friend. Like, I'll go to a museum and we'll sketch for two hours. And you know, there's no deadline to that. It's just free flowing. 
and uh, you're 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 using your your eyes to observe and and you're looking at something new like we went to the natural history museum one time and, and just drew dinosaur bones and that was so fun like just seeing dinosaur bones like skeletons and then also, also drawing them uh, it really uh, filled me up and uh, got me going again yeah all right Genevieve I, I have a lot of bad drawing days, so <laughs> <laughs> but I and it does help to take a mental break sometimes. Just like you know, you can't just keep going on something. You really don't want to burn yourself out. But um, and it does help to take a little of a break just to stop doing that. But when you come back to it, sometimes you, it helps me to. I, I'm an avid collector of art books, and um, that's like my favorite thing about going to cons is collecting artist sketchbooks and stuff. So I go, I go back to other people who inspire me, so I look at their stuff too. I watch old movies and animated films or um, listen to music that, in, that in evokes music videos in my head. Or, um, and, and, I, and I, you sometimes get yourself, uh, you remember what you got inspired by in the first place <coughs> to do this. So when you look at yeah. your hero's works and, yeah. what, and all that stuff, so that's what I would Yeah, <laughs> the music thing is, Definitely helps. I've been, uh, I've had the Lord of the Rings soundtracks uh, on repeat the past two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Now I just want to draw Lord yeah. of the Rings. There you go. <laughs> Walter? Yeah, the, the recurring thing I hear is that uh, you basically take a break, you know, give your, your brain some, some space. Um, I, I think that's what it is, you know, you, you, uh, mentally you walk into a street that's a dead end, and if you keep walking, you will just hit a wall. So you, you have to step back and uh, you know, doing something completely different. And I think ev everyone has their own preferences. Personally, I like to go for a walk uh, that does something to, you know, maybe it's the oxygen or just moving that refreshes everything. Uh, but then also, uh, you know, being a prof professional, uh, I think what's important is to make sure that your skill level is so that even your worst drawing is good enough uh, so that I in the on the days that it's not going well, you still can rely on on your skills, so you can do the work that you're hired to do. Absolutely, it's it's getting your mind on something else. But the reason I find like, why am I why am I blocked? Why 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 am I stuck? And I, and I've always come down to back to one thing, and it's I'm not inspired. And what you need to do is you you nailed it, Genevieve. Is you got to get inspired. So if that's looking for more research, more reference, more inspiration, going through art of books, going through your favorite stuff that, that reminds you of why you do what you do, that's, that's gonna get you back on track. You're gonna get that energy again. You're gonna be like, oh, this is, I got this. And then you're gonna go back and try it again and mess up a thousand more times, but it's all good. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, that's it's exactly what Daniel said, just what I used to do all the time where Again, before the internet and everything, it's all about gathering books, and that's how we had all our shelves. So a lot of us older guys have just a lot of books on our shelves, and it's just pulling those books off and just sitting back and just reading through an asterisk and obelisk or something and looking at Uderzo's work and going, damn, you know. But even tracing, just grabbing someone else's artwork when you're in that place and just redraw it. You know, you're not posting it. You're not sharing it. This is your own personal thing just to, just to get away from having the think stuff up you're just like let me just copy that let me draw that hand let me draw that gesture and that's a great way just to kind of get yourself in that inspirational mode through there um so we only got about 20 minutes left so i'd love to take just um some audience questions and the thing to do is um just to stand if you want to just come up and stand in line this is your opportunity this is about having confidence don't be afraid there's no stupid questions we're all in this together. So um, whoever wants to jump on up and ask, and I see that you're ready right there. You're leaning forward. I see it. I see it. I see that question coming out of you. <laughs> uh, is it okay if I ask um, like two questions? Sure. Yeah, and you can take the mask down too so we can hear you. Yeah. So I guess the first question is, when you're trying to like play with shapes for like characters, like, like I struggle with that. Like usually, I'm like when I'm trying to like draw a character, I just draw like how I want the character to look. I never really think about shape. How do you really like put that into your like drawings for your characters? You know. All right. Any of you guys want to take that? Well, I, uh, you know, there's this exercise I think most of you are familiar with, where you just draw a random shape, and no matter how crazy the shape is, you can always turn it into a face. 
that is in a way also true for for characters you know you can fill it with a, with a body and that way you know just as an exercise you know draw all different shapes and and by doing these random shapes you will end up drawing characters in a completely different way than you would usually do when you start you know constructing thinking of the anatomy and that can lead to ideas for for you know new new ways to approach that yeah like squiggly lines help too like just start squiggling lines on a page and uh and then yeah like fill it out make a character out of it oh wow that's my page too yeah hmm? i I, f I found that like uh I tend to not think about shape at all when I'm designing. Mm -hmm. I just let the characters come to me. And if the guy's a big guy, the guy's a big guy like Maui. And then, then there's a, a smaller character next to him, and then that's the other character. And then in the end, I'll start playing, putting the shapes back into it. But the, I'm, you, you, you can start to distract your brain too much if you're thinking about, I want to make a triangle, and this character's going to be a triangle, this character's going to be a square. It becomes style for style's sake. There's nothing really pure in there. That's not, there's nothing you can really pull from that feels like you can totally relate to it because it's all about style at that point. For me, style, it doesn't, I don't worry about it. it. I just draw and just make it, just, just do the things that, that you feel in your heart and that you, that you want to create, and then that stuff will come to you. Then, then you can go back and analyze your shapes, and then I, that's how I work backwards kind of like that. That's how it's worked for me. But uh, you guys, uh, Steven, you work a lot with shape, man. You, yeah, you, and yeah. you pull it off really well. So how do you do it? Well, yeah, I'm always just like, so shape for me is important. I like to start, but it's all about observation so much. Like we've talked about, just observe like Daniel, just even hold up your mug right there. Yeah. So people can see it. When you just even look at the shape of that mug, right? That could be the top part of someone's body and the bottom part of their legs. Right, you can turn, you can just start to see things. So look around, you look at the speaker, look at lights, just pay attention. You might even see on the carpet, sometimes you see shapes, you see shapes in the clouds and start pulling from that. And that's mm -hmm. how you can start to break up your shape language, get out of your constant, you know, you're always drawing the same shapes all the time. That's a great way just to fill up and expand your vocabulary. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Now my second question, you, you started to answer it. Now like, um, for like different styles of shows, like how do you know like to go like, like say you're like just it's just starting like how do you like keep every character to that style and like go to that style you know, like without like it, like say like you know like for example like um, SpongeBob looks like crazily um like incredibly different than um uh, fairly odd parents yeah I, so, I, I was I was gonna say something I, I was gonna, I do what he, what Steven said earlier. I, I look at the other person's drawings and not necessarily trace them, but draw their drawings and get myself in that world. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's one thing you know to do is just um, definitely if you're trying to figure out someone else's style, just figure out what that shape language is, draw something else. But it was your question about unifying. How do you unify yeah. a style? Like make all the characters feel consistent, so yes. they feel like they belong in the same universe. Yes. Yeah. Do you guys want to? I know. I know. And feature is different, to be honest, than television where feature you're doing a lot of blue sky you might just be working on one or two characters you don't have to do the whole lineup but in television animation this is where yeah you got to do this all the time yeah um like i i came on a show that's that was still like uh that was greenlit the the lineup had been somewhat figured out and lead designer uh made a style guide and most tv shows make style guides so the lead designer's like figuring out all that stuff, um, and, and you know, like, okay, this is how the hands will be drawn. Uh, she'll, br they'll break up the, the the characters into like basic shapes, like their body head and all that. Um, and you could sort of see an aesthetic, like, okay, like most of the hair like edges are like round. Um, the feet are really chunky. Um, so that's something that I'll definitely reference if I'm like if I'm in charge of designing uh, something new, and I'll go off of what they did. Um, and then like. Danny said earlier, it is collaboration, like you're not on your own. Um, so like the lead designer will like look at my stuff and we'll go back and forth until we get it right. I think it depends on the show also, because if you look at a show like Gumball, they have all the, the styles available in, in that show. So I, I think that also uh, make, yeah. makes a difference. Yeah, you know, so uh, just to finish up, it's about, you know, make, make those decisions. You've got to be decisive. Oh, all the characters have square fingers. You know, don't all of a sudden start popping in round fingers on characters, and that can take them away. Or if you look at, like, a Simpsons character where an eyeball is coming off the side of the face on a front three quarter, but all your other characters are, all their eyes are right next to each other and always contained, just watch for those things, those consistencies. 
Thank you. For the Thank questions. you so much. All right. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Great, Thank great you. questions. All right. And yeah, feel free to move your mouse so we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, All yeah. right, thank Thanks. you. <clears throat> so my question is, uh, oftentimes I find myself observating people, you know, on the street or on my way to my home. And I find it uh, amazing that you, you find uh, ideas, you know, you find like, mm -hmm. oh, uh, that person has like a funny mustache and stuff. But I find it difficult to find interactions, you know, inspiration for uh, making characters interact in a way that, you know, you use contrast in shapes and, and it's like relevant to the story. So I, I, I guess my question is, what is your approach when you are trying to get two characters to interact? And when do you know that interaction is strong enough to get into the audience? We usually have uh, storyboards done when we're in design. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our character moments or our interactions, I just look at the storyboards. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that and you're a student and you're learning and you're trying to figure that out, I would watch a lot of film okay. and, and really pull from real real live action film, not, not animation, but look at live action film and see how they interact with each other. And then, and then look at some animation too if it helps you, but then you can kind of caricature that and put it together and create moments for yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. a, a great place to, to uh, observe out, outdoors, you know, uh, is at an airport because people will either leave or come back and there's always so much emotion there. So that's a great place to, to actually see those interactions. Yeah, I mean, sometimes real life is like your best reference and sometimes it's just like really observing even if like you're doing something mundane like going to a laundromat, uh, which I did uh, because my laundry machine broke <laughs> recently. And kind of just everyone does things differently, like how they fold their clothes or mm -hmm. how they, uh, if they're stressed or not. Or, um, and I'm just like always like watching people watching like on my way to work or something. And like, and you could tell, you could read people like what their mood is. You know, that's a good exercise to practice. Like, like try to figure out like what are they feeling? Like what, what's going on? What's the story behind them? Like why do they look slumped over? You know, why do they look stressed or why, why are they happy? It's, it's a fun exercise and that can help if you observe their posture and your gesture, you could build a library in your head, yeah. take notes. Yeah. Like everyone said, that, um, find the story in, in the person's char character. So like when you observe a person, try to ex also maybe bring that out more, maybe exaggerate it and it make it read clearly. Um, the silhouettes and the poses read. Um, I think it'll <laughs> there was a, I just finished up, there was just a great, um, and you guys could probably find it online, it, it was very expensive at the time, but it was a correspondence course put out in the 60s by Norman Rockwell, Albert Dorn, Robert Fawcett, great illustrators, it's called the Famous Artist Course, it's like unbelievable, but the big thing they always carried through the whole correspondence course at that time was see, observe, remember. And that's what you got to do. You just got to keep your eyes open and constantly be observing. And that's how you start to see something. Oh my God, I'm at the restaurant and I see that old guy walking in with his son and it kind of looks so funny, that situation. You want to observe that. Don't just, you know, keep eating and look around. Just like pay attention. Okay. Yep. okay I, uh, can I ask one more question? Sure, sure. Yeah. sure. Uh, so my, my last question is, do you find yourself uh, drawing uh, inspiration from outside your uh, comfort zone or do sometimes you draw inspiration for cra from characters from, from maybe family members or like friends uh, which more is more often do, do you see the people like that's like really next to you or do you see people you know s just crossing down the street and you find it interesting is it a mix of both it's tough because sometimes uh Sometimes like I'll stick with someone like I remember going to a, like, a, a vintage clothing fair with my wife and like um, it was mostly women's clothes so I just ended up just sitting by the side sketching. Mm -hmm. and I remember following this lady like who had this beautiful like magenta dress and she had this like she was really elderly and she had like this amazing caricatured face and I just kind of I didn't stalk her but I, I watched her from afar like and I just drew her over and over like her posture and stuff. Sometimes like people like 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 I'll just stick with them and like really kind of figure them out based on real people. Um, and that might turn into something later, you know. I kind of I start with what emotion I'm feeling and uh, I, that kind of leads the, the shapes and the line of action that kind of directs it. And, and then you kind of go into your mental library of, of, of what you know from uh, like observing 
through either figure drawing or just going out to coffee shop and drawing, and you kind of merge that with the, with the, with the, with the you know, with the motion and the gesture, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think you naturally get inspired by what's around you, and uh, that's why I think it's a good thing to go out and draw people, because you don't want to, you know, draw your, your family. You know, you, you want your uh, inspiration to be as broad as possible. Uh, but when it comes to, you know, working on a project, then you probably start looking for a specific reference for what, what you need and combine that with, you know, your experience, everything that you have gathered over the years, and you want to make sure that it's as broad as possible. Yes, definitely. I, I pull stuff out of my comfort zone all the time. Uh, absolutely, because I don't know everything, you know, and there's a lot of things that I, I want to still learn. You know, I feel like I'm learning every day. So yeah, mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. feel free to pull out of your comfort zone and try different things. You know, you don't have to be amazing at it or great at it, but you know, at least be aware of it. You know. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Just come forward. Hello. I've, my question is just like when you're developing your own personal like portfolio of designs, and it's not for like no one's approving it. Say, if it's not for work. How do you how do you uh, let yourself be satisfied, and how do you like finish say like how do you let yourself say okay this design is good and i'm done versus just like endless iteration and like how do you be satisfied versus you know wanting to keep pushing in uh, yeah I, I i feel like uh you have to show other people and get get opinions also but you're gonna have your own taste you're gonna have your own likes and things that you're gonna like about it it's your portfolio is never really done you're kind of always you're gonna keep re i mean i'm still redoing mine all the time you uh, you you uh, just keep adding to it, you know. But keep working on a drawing. Get make sure you have something, you know. And then just leave leave it, you know. Go go to the next project, and keep creating more characters. Uh, so uh, yeah, that would be. Yeah. yeah. Well, for me, the, my default mode is to always think, hmm, how could we improve this? Or how did, could this be better? So I I completely understand where this question is coming from, and um, for me. Uh, I think, you know, I, in my, my, well, my work is really about coming up with ideas. It's not so much, you know, this is the character and, and now create the movie. It's, it's coming up with ideas all the time. So in my portfolio, I would rather, you know, put pages of, you know, explorations and showing why I, I chose for this outfit, why I chose this pose, and do another version where I tried something else so, uh, you know, the, the client can see that I can come up with ideas for their project because when they start, they don't know what the movie is going to be like. Uh, so if I can give them, uh, you know, suggestions, you know, uh, versions, um, I think that's more useful than showing how beautiful I can render a, a character. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Um, both, like, you're never gonna be satisfied <laughs> forever with the design. You're gonna always come back to it and see something wrong with it later on. But I think that shows that you're growing and you're improving and you're seeing mm -hmm. that what you can change and what you can improve. Um, but like, yes, yeah, show people, get feedback, and um, and then create other things around it. Like like do explorations with the other characters around it, the world, and that will probably inform what your main character looks like too so you might change it you might evolve yeah. due to what you create around that character yeah if there's other characters with that character specifically yeah that like like well this design doesn't really work with these other characters so maybe i should choose this one you know all right thank you thank you hello hello hi i guess i have a question that's kind of split. So you mentioned that it's important to like show variety in your work for character design. Yeah. And if, if you're having uh, a couple of different concepts to show on your portfolio page, do you have recommendations for how to experiment with the style for character design? Because everyone, you know, there's different mediums like stop motion and 2D and, and 3D. Do you have a way that you navigate to showcase your styles on your portfolio or do you try to emphasize what kind of work you want to lean towards if that makes sense yeah um did you guys catch that no, I can't, I can't yeah um 
So, I, I, so the question, sorry, there was just a lot of distraction with, if you guys, if you just wouldn't mind, just we only got a few minutes left just so that people can hear the questions, that'd be awesome, just, just hang out, we just got a few minutes left. Could you just quickly repeat that question? It was a little hard as the door was opening and closing. Yeah. So you guys mentioned uh, to have variety on your portfolio, but I was curious about uh, when there's different mediums like stop motion or 3D or 2D, if you're making a character design portfolio, how you can showcase the different styles like for each like project that you showcase yeah. versus um, if you're trying to emphasize like I want to work just for 3D or 2D do you need to like have a certain style that you show on your portfolio right. yeah I think the most important thing is just your designs you know if whether it's for 3D animation 2D animation or uh, stop motion like you mentioned it, it doesn't matter like your designs are what matters so I would just focus on that one style your style, you know, whatever that is, right? Yeah, because I think like what Water, Water said, like being able to show variety and, and essentially what you're going to be doing is presenting options to the director, you know? Yeah. Like this is, here's who we, here's, here's the casting call. Who do you want to cast for your character? And that's what you're providing. You're providing options for who that character is going to be. Yeah, and I think the technical limitations or, or specifics of, of the medium yeah. Uh, they come later, you know. Yeah. If, if, if yeah. especially if you're, you know, coming up with ideas for what the character could be at all, then that's not really what you should concern be concerned with just yet. That you know, they can fix those things later and make it useful for stop motion, for example. Yeah. And I, you know, I just I'm, I'm work as a recruiter now at Disney TBA, and what we're just looking for is you got to be a chameleon. You got to have that versatility. Can you do? big city greens sort of style. You're not putting in the fan art, but can you go from that range to all of a sudden, maybe it's a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or a Proud Family or SpongeBob, you know, throwing in that range, just you want to fill your portfolio with that. Don't be a one trick pony because yep. that's going to be very hard yep. uh, to kind of get hired, especially on the TV side. Yep. Um, so be as versatile as possible. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, right. so just to confirm, so you still can be versatile with your range because you know different like either drama or comedy kind of thing absolutely but also keep your style at the same time yeah well, i mean sense. your style's gonna yeah there's gonna be some of you in there you know yeah. so you're showing some of you you want to be distinctive for sure so show some of yourself but also show that range as well that you can adapt you know okay to All different right. languages so to speak yeah yeah well thank you for your time yeah. All right. So if you guys could, um, yeah, we, I think we just got about three minutes left here, or two minutes left here. So um, just on the uh, questions, answers, sort of short, try to get the last three people. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Steven. Hi. <laughs> um, this is a quick question. It's kind of fun. Um, character designer and or artist that you grew up really enjoying or was a big influence or that currently now? Biggest inspiration? Who was your oh, growing gosh. up? Like, who was the one that kind of did it for you, or does it yeah. for you today? So. As a as a as a kid, uh, the big ones were Glenn Keane and Eric Goldberg, and then uh, as I progressed, like I got into Al Hirschfeld, uh, old caricature artists like Al Hirschfeld, Miguel Covarrubias, and then the mid-century modern influences like Tom Orb, um, Gene Deitch. Um, yeah, so all that that all that's now a mishmash <laughs> for me. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, it was like Chuck Jones and, and uh, all the Disney Nine Old Men. Um, and then I grew up and I started liking anime too. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was, I, and I, like now there's like, trigger, the trigger artists like uh, Sushio and uh, Imaishi, uh, Yoshinari, and um, tons of other artists online. Um, but I also loved. European comic artists too, um, like Pierre Allery and and uh, you know um, Buonjo Buoni Buonjo Garnido. I don't know. I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> Buonjo Gar Garnido. Um, uh, and uh, the just like a, a lot of like I collect a lot of art books. So it's just like I started spending a lot of money in Stuart Inc. <laughs> so it's just <laughs> a lot of uh, different inspirations. Um, but yeah. Right. <laughs> um, well, I didn't have access to, to so many uh, art books uh, when I was young. My dad uh, is an artist, though, so he had some art books. Uh, one that really made an impact was David Levine, a caricature artist, uh, especially his watercolors. Uh, and uh, Gaston, the comic, 
Is that mm -hmm. uh, what it's called here? Yeah. Uh, Andre Franquin. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, he had a book of Norman Rockwell. So those were basically the three things that I had when I was growing up. <laughs> two, two of my biggest inspirations, three, uh, Hank, Hank Ketchum, the creator of Dennis the Menace comic series, Tony Ficilli, and Teddy Uh Just hands down, I've learned everything from those guys. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, I just want to know a little about how is working uh, for a company uh, a little about how is the pipeline and how is uh, working uh, in a in a team uh, hmm. I, I just yeah yeah so long story short um it's <laughs> i mean you work in an office building uh you get an assignment uh you have a deadline you try to get it done by the deadline um sometimes you you submit it for review maybe you have an art director or lead designer and they give you drawovers um, and I essentially you know, do those drawovers uh, and correct my drawings, and then they get approved, and you move on to your next assignment. Um, and TV, the pipeline is really fast. Like I have like maybe two weeks to finish uh, a bunch of different uh, designs or templates. I would say like more than anything, learn how to develop tough skin. Mm -hmm. Don't don't be. I mean, <laughs> you, you get shot down a lot. Like you, we can turn in our assignments, and we already know they're not going to be the ones. You're, you, oh, yeah. you already know, you just, I mean, this isn't it, but I just want to get it in front of them, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you just don't gotta, get too attached. Don't get attached yeah. to anything. Yeah. The bottom line is just, if you get your deadlines, you know, meet your deadlines, you know, it can be uh, hard. Sometimes you might have to design 100 characters in two weeks. So I would say just build up your speed, just in general. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you so much. And we'll take one last quick, oops, one last quick question and answer it, and then we'll let you guys free. Hi, uh, I just want to say thank you for being out here and for sharing your knowledge and uh, uh, for the last question. I wanted to ask, uh, do you guys have any tips on ways to improve your portfolio? I know you guys have been talking a lot about variety, but is there anything else that might help us stand out uh, with our portfolios and what we can do? Yeah. Well, well, a, a specific thing about variety, the, what I would do is that I would uh, – uh, take you know create uh, three or four imaginary projects so that y you know you do a, a maybe a science fiction project a medieval project one that's cartoony one that pushes a little more towards realism depending you know what you're aiming for if you're aiming for TV of course you have to keep that in mind but you know uh, so that you have a little project where you can uh, create characters for that that are a cast you create some situations, some facial expressions, but then for this other project, you have the same thing, but in a slightly different style, uh, so that you can see that you can create characters that belong to a, a certain style, but you're also able to work in a completely different style. That's probably how I would uh, approach it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I think we've kind of been told to wrap it up. Um, I, anyway, I, uh, <laughs> is there anyone want to say any last minute? Last thing, you guys, is I, I, I found that this is really helpful for learning character design, too, is also think about animating your characters hand-drawn. Like, just think, think how they would act in those, those poses. You can pull so many designs from those. Thank you, guys, okay. for showing up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank Have you. a great day. Enjoy your rest of the time.